Do you know Mr. Crow? Yes, I do know Mr. Crow. Yeah, I love Mr. Crow. Damn it. Yes. Yes, I love Mr. Crow. Yes, I know Mr. Crow. Yeah, I've had him as a sub a few times. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah I've had him as a sub too. Yes, yes, I do. I know Mr. Crow. Yeah. Yes. I do. Yes, I do. I do know Mr. Crow. Of course. Yeah, of course I know Mr. Crow. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. I, yeah, I do. I do know Mr. Crow pretty well, yeah. 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 Yes, I do. Yes, I know Mr. Crow. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know Mr. Crow. Yeah. Yeah, I think everyone knows Mr. Crow. <laughs>
Yeah, so sometime around October 10th, an ice hockey um, surface was named on his behalf in East Petersburg. It's well-deserved. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is, well, we know a lot about Mr. Crow, but some of us didn't know his involvement um, with uh, street hockey, you know, over in East Pete. And so when I read that in the paper, you know, I was, just, I was amazed, you know, that I couldn't believe I didn't know this about him. And I, I've always tried to take an interest and talk to him about books, that he, we read a lot of the same books and movies we talk about. But hockey never came up. Um, so I tell you what, I was really impressed when I read those articles and then I saw him in school the day after, you know, the story was in the paper. And I said, hey, congratulations. He said, yeah, and then he kind of dismissed it, like he didn't want the attention. I am so happy that Mr. Crow is getting recognized because, again, he is a very, uh, he's, much, he's a servant. He would do anything um, for anyone. And he gives up a lot of his free time for other people. And so the fact that he's getting recognized, I just love it. A whole ice rink named after him, perfect. It's great. It's like his name will be remembered for perpetuity. It's wonderful. Uh, I love the article that was on Langster Online about it. I was shocked. I think the name, The Crow's Nest, is incredibly fitting. Uh, you know, I think it just goes to show that his, you know, he's had such an impact not only on school, on students in school, but, but out of school as well with hockey. Uh, and it's a great reward for him to, to get his, you know, to get some, some recognition for all the hard work he's done. I had no idea of his connection to the, the ice rink and ice hockey until I saw it on Twitter, but it's very exciting for him to have that kind of legacy. Wow, already to the last question for the teachers. Do you have any stories of him? I've known Mr. Crow for a long time. I can't pinpoint exactly how long that's been, but uh, as long as I've been teaching here, I've, I feel like I've, Mr. Crow has been around. Uh, Got to know Mr. Crow also outside of school. He's a big baseball fan, so at Kunkel Field, when some of our Penn Manor teams would play there, he, he would come and watch them, as well as at the Reading Phillies. Mr. Crow is a big Reading Phillies fan, so I would run into him at the Reading Phillies quite often. Uh, always likes to talk about baseball, but also about Penn Manor and the students and how they contribute uh, in different activities. I did play hockey uh, back in the day when he was, he used to be a coach, he still is a coach. And one thing that was really interesting about Mr. Crow is that everybody wanted him to coach their team. Mm -hmm. So he was probably coaching teams at every mm -hmm. level. So uh, he had youth league, adult league, uh, different levels within those. And he, he may have been coaching many, many teams at, at a time. And that's the kind of guy that he was. He would volunteer his time and he would uh, be the type of player or type of coach that every player would mm -hmm. want to play for. Really got to know him when I arrived here in 2007. Um, because I was working on a project about the anniversary of the Little Rock Nine um, for the students here at Penn Manor, and uh, I wanted to connect what happened for this major historical event for th with things that happened locally. And he's a graduate of, of McCaskey, and there were some uh, pretty significant racial confrontations that happened uh, both at McCaskey and the city of Lancaster in the late 60s when he was a student there. Uh, and then um, our student body went through a racial confrontation in the late 90s, and he was a substitute here at the time, so he had witnessed all these events. Uh, and he was very open um, to sitting and chatting with me and the students that I had helping me on the project. And that's how I really got introduced to Mr. Crow, was just a guy that was open to, to telling stories and, you know, educating minds. We are starting to get to know Mr. Crow a lot more. Let's see what the students have to say about him. Total mad lad best teacher ever. He's the greatest substitute. Every time he walks around in class, everyone's always having fun. Everyone's smiling. People are playing rock, paper, scissors with him. He's one of the like favorite substitutes I've ever had. He's very kind. He's very sweet. And all around, just a nice guy. I think he's um, an inspiration to many children here. Uh, he's just, uh, I don't know, just cool. Yeah, he makes everyone very happy. I think he's a really nice substitute. He's uh, When he gets in the room, it kind of brings a carefree environment. Uh, every time I, I go into a classroom and he's there, <laughs> I usually think it's going to be a pretty good day. I think he's probably the best sub there is because he's sub for like all of the schools and he kind of knows like he knows everyone and he's like easy to talk to and stuff like that. He's uh, really chill, really personable. You talk to him, you know, hold a conversation and it's not awkward. He doesn't yell at you, so that's really cool. And But you can yell at him, that's the thing. Probably one of the best substitute teachers. He's really fun uh, to be around and he's understanding of the students and what they go through in class, so he makes it 
really easy. He's so fun, he's energetic, he's like the best teacher here. And he also looks like Albert Einstein, so that's a plus. Um, he's a great substitute teacher and he really like works well with, with his students that he has and like makes sure everyone has a good day. Dude, he's just like the best substitute teacher you could have. He's like chill, but he's like really fun at the same time, but he like gets his job done. The crew is the best substitute in the world. Everyone loves Mr. Crow. He always has his stuff together. He always knows what he's doing. He's always fun. He makes class lit. Mr. Crow's the best sub. Um, because he's probably the best sub. He's pretty funny. He tells some good stories. He's a really funny guy and he's a really great substitute teacher. He's just such an inspiring guy, such a cool guy, like relatable to every person in every generation. He's a legend. He's just he, a great teacher. Yeah, he's so laid back and I don't know, he's just a great person to talk to. He's nice. I think that he should be the official school mascot. Share stories that you might have of him. Like the first time he was my sub was in eighth grade science class and I remember thinking that like the first thought that I had when I saw him was that he looked like Albert Einstein, <laughs> but um, and I, I thought it was kind of weird and uncanny. But then when I actually talked to him, I was like, this guy's super like laid back about everything, and but in a good way, like not so much that I guess everything gets out of control. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He finds like that happy medium. Every time I had him as a sub after that, it was like, yes, we got Mr. Crow. Yeah, I remember having him um, my freshman year, and um, he came into the class, and we were all just like, okay, it's a sub. There's going to be like a bunch of work and stuff. And then he just went on with this whole life lesson about stoplights. I don't remember the full thing, but it was just a whole life lesson in the whole block, and we just did everything we had to do for homework, but I didn't mind. It was great. Well, he made me make paninis in chemistry class. Like the last week of school, it's, it's great. Yeah, I like didn't know who he was, but I heard everyone talk about like Mr. Crow and how he's like the coolest substitute ever. And then I had him in ninth grade, and then I've had him once more, I think last year in 11th grade. And I just remember him like talking to us, and he like genuinely cared, and he always remembers us and says hi. And then I remember I saw a couple of my friends went to the March for Our Lives in Lancaster, while the, a couple of my other friends went to Washington. I remember they saw him there, and he's just like really active and cares about his students. One time I walked into class. And he was standing there, and he was arm wrestling one of the students, and he won. And after he won, someone said he looked like Albert Einstein, and the whole class laughed. One time we were in Spanish class, and he was a sub, and he tried to speak Spanish and failed miserably, <laughs> but it was really funny. Always used to fill in for our um, AP seminar class when Mr. Mealy wasn't there last year. And Mr. Crow, you know, he just has really good grip on, you know, like, like, social issues going on the nation so every time he, he would come and sub he would just bring in some interesting article for us to read about you know police brutality or something like that and it was just really awesome because you know he really he really did a good job when he really didn't have to so oh one time we were in class and we had to do a bunch of reading and when we were about to go to lunch he dropped the book accidentally because he was reading it and a magazine fell out from behind it and everyone just laughed. Yeah, he brought in one time, he was stubborn for our history class. He had this band sheet of his that he was on tour with and it showed like his set list or something like that, I don't know. But he, brought, he, he talks a lot about, you know, the old days. Yeah, I mean, every time our teacher says we're gonna have a sub, I know that every single person in the class, like secretly or out loud, is like, is it Mr. Crow? Um, and so when he finally gets there, all we do is kind of talk for a little bit, definitely about movies is kind of my favorite memory of him, uh, especially talking about, um, there's this one movie, Black Klansman, that he done and I talked about for like 15 minutes. Well, every time you walk in the hallway with Mr. Crow, everyone, you can't hold a conversation with him, because like the whole school knows him, you know? He's like a celebrity around here. When I was in eighth grade, we had a, dress up as a teacher or dress up as a celebrity day and I bought this wig and it was like bald to right here and then it was just gray hair and I got a tie that Mr. Crow used to always wear and I dressed up as him and I got a picture in it. I still have it. It's time for the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Crow. Let's get to know him. How did you first become a substitute teacher? Well, I, I went to college, I wanted to be a teacher and I never got a full-time job so I started subbing and I just kind of seemed to get in that routine. I couldn't get a full-time job, so I was away for a year and a half from subbing, and I missed it and came back. Um, well, I wanted to be a full-time teacher, but before I was just sort of kicking around from different jobs. I got laid off from a couple of jobs, and, and actually the, the 
what made me decide to go with full time and become a teacher was when I got laid off from the place I was at at the time. What's your favorite memory of subbing? Pro probably when I had the long term things. I, I was over for Mr. Goo over at Manor Middle twice. One, one year he had a mini stroke, unfortunately, and I filled in for a marking period. And then I filled in a marking period for him a couple years later. And um, I enjoyed that. Then I was actually teaching and, you know, making lesson plans. It was a lot of work, but I, you know, I, I enjoyed it because that's what I wanted to do. Why do you enjoy teaching so much? I've always liked being around young people to start with. You know, it, it, they always say, I'll just keep you younger. I think it does. I just seem to relate to them better. And, you know, if, if I can talk to someone about something and educate them a little bit on the topic, you know, it makes you feel good that you uh, could teach them something anyhow. So, and like I said, unfortunately, when I was younger, I wasn't interested in school that much, but I always liked my history courses. You know, I like I, I liked to sort of see what people went through so we could have it this nice now, you know, and, and it makes you appreciate it when you think about the hard work they did, you know, just just that my parents did. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever seen the Dairy Queen on Columbia Avenue? Yeah. That picture on the wall of the Dairy Queen that opened? And I was sitting there one night and I was looking at it and I thought, you know what, there's not one overweight person on that picture. And that's because back then people had jobs that they had to work hard. I think it's probably back in the 40s. That, that's the generation my mom and, and dad were growing up in, you know. And the people worked hard at you know, so they, they didn't, I, I couldn't see, I couldn't spot one person that looked overweight. And that's amazing, because now probably half the crowd would be overweight, you know. Coaching hockey is teaching, you know, you're still teaching the game. I've always, uh, you know, heard that my teams seem disciplined. Even though I always laugh, because we were at a tournament one time in Reading, and one guy came up to me and said, we. Rumors going around that I had played for the Hershey Bears, mm -hmm. and I said, "No, I never played for Hershey." And they said, "Oh, we just thought that because your team's so disciplined." I thought, "If you'd been on the bench, wherever they're making fun of each other and having a good time," but, mm -hmm. but you know, I always got the message across of how they had to play too, though. You know, what was high school like for you? Right. I, I was different then. You know, I, believe it or not, my senior year, I I was worried with about two finals. That if I didn't pass them, I wasn't going to graduate. So I, I really goofed around a lot in high school and. Uh, I was just telling the class the other day what really changed it around was um, when I was out of high school, I was always into politics. Even when I was a young kid, I liked it. And I, 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 of course, the late 60s, you're talking about, you know, the Vietnam War was going on, the civil rights movement. And I started reading a book, some political books. And once I got wrapped up in reading, that kind of changed my life around. It really did. And I still, I constantly am reading something now. Junior high, I played. Uh, Basketball, football, my ninth grade year I went out for track. Actually, I actually have a picture of me running right over there <laughs> against Penn Manor. I went to a city school. Funny. <laughs> and you can see the sugar bowl in the background. Where did you go to college? Well, I had one year in at FM. I, I had paid, I was saved up to take a course. Maybe not take it for anything for a while, then save up again, take another course. But I had 33 credit, credits, and I got my degree from Millersville. Well, I, I, I wanted to take, um, I think I said I wanted to take a, a, get a degree in psychology, but they said you can't. So I, I took, um, I started off with a uh, social studies with a minor in psychology. First psychology course I took, I was in with a bunch of psych majors, and, and I asked them how many credits they had to have, and I realized I was like three courses away. So I just went down to declare a double major. So I ended up having a double major. But unfortunately with psychology, there's not much you can do with that either until you get a master. And I was figuring after I graduate, I'd get a full-time teaching job, uh, keep taking courses in psychology, maybe get a master's and do part-time counseling or something. What did you do in your free time at college? Especially my last year, I didn't have much free time because I was working and then I had, you know, um, I, I remember my senior year, I was, I was, I was working, you know, doing student teaching, and then the street hockey league started in the middle of it, yes, so I had all that, so I remember I, I would be uh, at a laundromat or something doing clothes and making lesson plans or correcting tests or, you know, I, I didn't have a whole lot of time, so. What's the craziest memory that you have? I don't know if you know, I was taken to the ball hockey hall of fame, that's why they had that ceremony that they named the rink after me. And I saw the one guy there that night, and I said to him, do you remember Back in that, he played in the street hockey league um, when I started running it. And him and a couple other kids and me went up to Mount Gretna, the lake there to swim. He wasn't a good swimmer. They didn't have them little piers. Mm -hmm. Well, we started swimming in from there. Two of the guys that were on were good swimmers. They took the inner tube, but yeah. swam, they, they'd always swam in. 
we're coming in. He started going under. I, I kept getting under him and pushing him up. I was starting to get tired, so I thought, I gotta get them out here. So I yelled at the guys to bring out the inner tube, and they looked at me, and they told me later they thought I was sort of joking. And I said, guys, get them out here now. And I tell you, if anyone had gotten them out there, we might have both drowned, because I was getting to the point I couldn't, I was getting tired, but I kept thinking, I can't let this kid drown. I just felt horrible, you know, so. That was, I mean, it's kind of a bad thing. Yeah, it's kind of good, it turned out good. But he said he was, had just thought of that too. I, I thought either one of us would have been there at that <laughs> ceremony that night. What was it like getting a roller hockey rink named after you? Yeah, that, that, that was really neat. It was really nice of him. I didn't expect it. Um, I said it's kind of funny. You get awarded for doing something you've enjoyed doing all these years. You know, I, I, I had no clue it was coming up. I, I was up there that day. I just ref the game. I saw him carrying a table out in the rink. All these people were going out. Everybody kept walking past me. I kept saying, what's going on? What's going on? Nobody would answer me. So they were all out there, and then they, um, I was still outside the rink. And then one guy goes, Don, come on out here. So I finally went out, and then they started talking. I realized what it was, and it really, it really took me by surprise, and I was shocked, but I really appreciated it. It was nice they did that, you know. How did you get into hockey? Well, I used to play street hockey in Lancaster, and one guy started the youth league, and that'd be neat. I wish I could do that. And he was getting to the point, he said he was too busy to do it. So he asked me to take it over. He had teams and there was like new kids were joining. And this team became so big that I said to him, well, why don't you take the older guys and I'll take the younger guys and coach them. Uh, unfortunately, there weren't any younger leagues at that time. So I basically had a 9-11 team playing against older guys. And I remember the first season I had them, I don't think we even scored a goal all year. We were getting hammered every game. And then we finally had enough kids that we formed a younger division. And then we did pretty good, but um, I just enjoy showing kids the game and I mean at least I got, that's one form of teaching I've done now for, you know, close to 40 years, you know. What's your favorite hockey memory that you have? I, I do remember one time I went to, to Reading at a, to a small tournament and the team I coached, that was a little different, we, it wasn't like a full team thing, I think we only played half game, that's how it was, you know, we, full team but a half game. And we beat the one team that was actually national champions the year before. So that, that was probably one that was enjoyable there. But I always enjoyed coaching and taking the kids to Niagara Falls was really nice for them too. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to do up there. What kind of activities did you do when you were a kid? I remember when, um, what, what, we always talk about that now, when I talk to somebody my age, how we were always active. Mm -hmm. And I get down and, and I used to, I grew up the street from McCaskey on Franklin Street. And some of my friends and I would meet in that big field from McCaskey and we'd play baseball all afternoon. And then you know, I'd go home, eat my supper, and I'd go back down, we'd either play ball again or ride our bikes. Or uh, at that time, if you're familiar with where Lincoln Middle School is, that was all woods at when I was a kid. We'd go up in there and you know, play in the woods, or, but we were always doing something. My dad and I went to, um, we used to go out to Lancaster Red Roses games. That, that was a minor league baseball team. They were double A, like Reading and Phillies are now. I, I, I won, I was nine years old, two free tickets to the 1960 All-Star game in Yankee Stadium, and my dad took me up to it. So that, that was the big memory. Um, Ted Williams was actually there yet. And when you look at the names in that program, it's like a Hall of Fame game. It was Wade Ford, Mickey Mantle. I, I was a big Yankee fan when I was a kid. And the other big thing I saw when I was a kid, my dad and I went up to Hershey the night Will Chamberlain had 100 points. And I still have the program, I had the program from the All-Star game too, you know. But uh, both those are really some of my big, and then, you know, I always like going to picnics now with my family and things like that too. What's the most famous baseball card do you have signed? Because I guess some, some guys, these have games at Reading where they bring in, uh, like I have Raleigh Fingers, he's a Hall of Famer. Steve Garvey, Greg Nettles, and some, some of the newer guys. You know, I got a lot of the guys that are playing out in the playoffs. Travis Shaw, I have him. Manny Machado, I got him. Very short autographed MM, yeah. but you know. What's your favorite sport memory? I'd say the, the best one is probably the 100 point night at Hershey, because that was a historical night. Rogers throws long to Chamberlain. He's got it. He's trying to get up. He shoots. No good. The rebound, Luckenbill. Back to Chamberlain. He shoots. Up. No good. In and out. The rebound, Luckenbill. Back to Rucklick. Into Chamberlain. I 
loved the All-Star game, too. But, I mean, that's something that I don't think will ever be topped. You hear all this talk about LeBron James or Michael Jordan being the best of all time, but, you know, Will Chamberlain is still, you know, maybe I'm a little biased for but, but he, you know, there's years he'd average like 50 a game. I mean, that's incredible. Of course, when you're 7'1", everybody else is 6'10". That was about the biggest centers. And the night he had 100, I remember they just kept feeding it underneath to him. Mm-hmm. And he turned around and dunk it. There were, he also had a good night from the foul line, too. Which, he shot the old way underhand. That, they, some people actually shot it like that mm-hmm. back then. And he actually had a good night of foul shots. And normally, he wasn't a good foul shooter. I've seen films of him not, uh, mm-hmm. about... I, I showed one last year in Mr. Stewart's class, and there's nobody there to film the game. They have no film of it at all, because of being in Hershey. They go up there a couple of times a year back then. Nobody was there. A lot of the reporters didn't even bother going that night. They said, ah, it's just Hershey. Nothing's going to happen anyhow. And turn into a historical night. But the fans, as, as the game went on, you started getting the sense, hey, wait a minute, this guy's going to, it's going to have a big night. And um, they kept getting more excited as the game went on. I, I was trying to keep score being a little kid. I had it. At the bottom, I wrote in the program, Wilt scored 100 points, you know, at the bottom. I don't think I really appreciated the historical significance of it yet. But Dad took me up, I was always, Wilt was like my hero when I was a kid. And um, I, I remember I went out in the court after the game, hoping to get his autograph, but he didn't sign anything. But I remember looking up at him, he was so, I mean, seven foot one. He looked so big to me. I was, I think, 11 at that time. You know, he, I remember when I'd play, I'd always wear a rubber band around my wrist, because he always did that for luck, you know. So, you know how you are when you're a kid, you want to yeah. do whatever your hero does. Well, I always had, like in baseball, I like Mickey Mantle. Basketball, I like Will Chamberlain. And football, I like Jim Brown, played for the Brown, running back for the Browns. So, I don't know. I, I think just because he was big. And, and at that time, he was like really, you know, they, the guys weren't as big as they are now. So, he really stood out. And I was tall for my age. So, I kind of like, you know, I had these dreams. I was going to be 6 foot 11 when I grew up and ended up 5'11". Uh, how did you become an Eagles fan? I don't know. I mean, I was, I've always had like three teams, the Browns, the Bears, and the Eagles. Browns, I know why I like them, because I always like Jimmy Brown, the running back. Mm-hmm. And I guess the Eagles just being the home team. And back when I was a kid, they used to have their uh, camp up at Hershey. And my uncle took me up there to see him, and he took me down to an Eagles-Bears game. I uh, mean, Eagles-Browns game. I got to see Jimmy Brown down in Philly. And that was at the old Franklin Field. That was before the vet even. So I, I just kind of grew, you know, I always liked Philadelphia teams. I then win the Super Bowl last year. Well, I, I tell you, it was a lot of years of frustration. I'm, I'm sure every Eagle fan would say that. You know, it's, it's, it was a long time. I said, you know, I was just like, it was almost like a relief as much as it was a celebration. You know, like, well, finally we did it, you know. What was the experience like watching Jim Brown play? I really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, he didn't have a real good game that day, though. One thing I always remember about him is he would always get up slow after, after he got tackled. That way, the other team never knew if they hurt him or not. He, he, liked doing, he did that intentionally. He'd get up real slow each time, so you didn't know if you'd, you know, because sometimes they get up slow, it means you, you shook him up, you know. He didn't want him to know that. Do you have any siblings? I have a brother, an older brother. Um, well, I remember growing up, we, we were kind of, he's seven and a half years older than I am. So growing up, we, we were kind of distant because when you're 15, you don't want to hang around your seven-year-old brother, you know. But as we got older, we got closer then, you know. I do remember sometimes him and his friends would take me, they took me out for a walk one night. They, they were doing all kinds of things to scare me. Though. They were like, you know, they'd be talking to me. That one of them would throw a stone in the woods and I'd hear it and I'd turn around and they'd go, oh, what's that? You know, I was getting all scared. Uh, they were just doing that because, you know, typical, you know, again, he was 15, I was like seven, so. You know, I don't know if you have any siblings, but you know you, how you like to torment them. What was your childhood like? Well, you know, my brother said to me once, you know, he said, we were poor, and I, was, I didn't think about it, and I thought, yeah, I guess we were. It's, you know, we begin the school year, I get like two good pair of pants to wear, and by the end of year, they'd have patches on me. You know, if you didn't, but then again, a lot of people back then did that, you know, but, um, but again, my parents always were kind of, um, made me appreciate, you know, simple things in life that, you know, if you can't afford to, I, I, my mother used to say to me, you know, you can't help being poor, but you can't help being dirty. You know, she was always big on keeping clean and that. You know, they had the old fashioned washing machine yet where you had to run it through the ringer and all that stuff. But um, and, and that's one of the reasons I think I always liked, like my favorite saying in life is, uh, I have a poster, that's Henry David Thoreau, where he said that that man is the richest whose pleasures are the cheapest. And I was kind of like, look at my parents for putting that in me because I enjoyed going to family picnics and 
you know, we do things like that that didn't, didn't cost money, but we, you know, we still enjoyed things. So, what is your favorite family memory? Oh, like I said, going on those picnics meant a lot. Um, I remember one time my parents took me down to uh, uh, Bull Run, the battlefield in Virginia. I remember we went on a day trip that time. We drove down, came back the same day. Because I know, uh, again, not to have the money, you know, if we did anything, it was like sort of a day thing. We never stayed overnight anywhere. A lot of little things. Um, my dad would take me out. To, sometimes when I was a smaller child, he'd take me out when he'd get home and we'd play baseball. And then in winter, he take me out and pulled me around on my sled. Just little things like that makes you appreciate things. If we look back on that, that's the kind of little things you look at and appreciate, you know. What was it like growing up in the 50s and 60s? Well, it's definitely different than it is now. I mean, um, of course, we had none of the technology that's around now. So it's hard to tell whether I always say we were a lot more active then because, but then again, we didn't have the temptations you have now to sit and play video games and that. But, I always thought, I, I don't think I would like that. I always think I was the type of kid that wanted to get out and do things, not sit around, but you don't know if, if it was around. But it was a lot simpler. I mean, I remember the, the old dial phones, yeah, movies, movie, that was another thing that was different. Movies and TV, they were all like family related. You didn't have to worry about different, whether it was adult, you know, for adults or whatever, it was all for families, you know, so that was different too. What other hobbies are you into other than hockey? Well, again, I like to read, and I love history. So every every summer my uh, vacation based, I go somewhere for a few days, and I'll have it all planned out. I already know where I'm going next summer, and I'll have it all planned out and go to the historic sites. And then I also love going to minor league baseball games in the summer. And I've started over the last at least 20 years now. I get autographs at minor league games. So I have a pretty good collection of autographs from minor league games. It's like a hobby of mine. Then in the winter I like going to F and M basketball games. I got all their home games in basketball. What different states have you been to? On vacation, I've been to Massachusetts, New York, uh, Virginia, Tennessee last year. The one year I took a big trip, I went out to, um, I went to see Harry Truman's home in Missouri. So it was like, a, I think a 10 day trip. And I went out 70, which took me out through Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. Then I dropped down with, into Missouri. And I came back through Tennessee and up through Virginia. I really liked it. And I, I was stopping at places along the way, too. So I saw a lot of different homes and things that summer. I think I put like 3,500 miles on in 10 days. So I was a lot of driving. I was up in New England a couple of years. I liked it there, too. You know, I went up to Concord, Lexington. I really liked that area up there. Have you ever been outside the country? When I coached street hockey, we went up there to, to Niagara Falls, to tournaments. So I went up there several years in a row. That was another place I really enjoyed to go, too. It seemed like every year, even though you had been up there a few years in a row, I'd look forward to seeing the falls again, because they are really, they're really neat to see. But that, that said, I've never been out of the country otherwise. What's the biggest historical event that you remember? The big one was when uh, JFK got assassinated. I was in seventh grade at the time. Yeah, you know, they always say that, that you remember exactly where you were at when that moment hit. And I, I remember, I can, you know, I was in seventh grade English class, Mrs. Weisberg, and I, and I didn't remember any of my other seventh grade teacher, but just because I was there, and came over the intercom that uh, uh, Kennedy had been shot. Now, he wasn't dead yet. And then we, we had a, a prearranged assembly at the end of the day, and I remember the principal came out on the stage and said, our president is dead. So I remember everything, you know, and then, of course, we had our school, and I remember being at home watching the parade on television, and talking about technology, if it weren't black and white television, you know. Well, of course, 9-11. And I, I always told kids in school at that time, you always remember where you were at. And then, <laughs> then a few years, kids started saying, oh, Mr. Crow, we were only like two years old now. Like, okay, never mind, you know. But I always tell them, if anything does big, does happen, you'll remember right where you were at. Yeah, 9-11 and Kennedy's, Kennedy's assassination probably had the biggest impact on me, though, you know. How do you think you have influenced the students at Penn Manor? Well, I hope in a positive way. I mean, I always try to <clears throat> treat them with respect. And I, I feel they treat me with respect for the most part. In fact, just yesterday, one, the one boy was talking a little too much. And Hannah, they have, when they come back over the lunch period, they, they read for 15 minutes. And I, I asked him to go out in the hall to read because he wasn't getting quiet. And in the way out, he apologized to me twice. And I thought, well, I, you know, I show respect. By that, I try to be nice to everybody, even kids that aren't, especially kids that are quiet now, I try to talk to them a little bit, just to make them feel part of the class. How do you feel about students coming up to you and saying hi? I, I like that too a lot. You know, it makes me, makes me feel like maybe it did make a little difference in their life. You know, I do have a lot of people um, who come up to me. The, the other summer I was at a concert at Lawrence Park, 
and a girl came up to me with her, she was carrying a baby, and she told me she had me years ago, and she said, uh, she was a teacher now, she said, you inspired me to become a teacher. And that really made me feel good. It really made me feel good. Because I thought, well, at least I've, you know, there's a positive influence in her life, you know. What kind of advice do you have to students? Well, I, I would have to say work hard in school. Because I know, as much as I enjoy, I, I love doing it, going to college and that, and I, I could still take courses. I enjoyed it. But it's, I don't advise wait till it's, till you're later in life. Um, it, it really messed me up financially, it really did. Because when I was going through Millersville, even when I worked, I mean, that, that money couldn't go toward college courses because I'd already, was out of school and had bills. I was just going toward my bills. So I was running up, I, I ran up some debt, and I didn't run up anywhere near the debt a lot of these kids are now. But to try in school, and I always tell kids, try hard in everything, because I worked with a guy that was a machinist. They have different levels, and he was telling me, he, he was going for a higher level of machinist, and he said, I wish I, I wish I'd have tried harder in math in school. I didn't think I needed it be, to be a machinist, but there's a lot of math in being a machinist. So I always tell kids that, you know, you don't know what you're going to need to know in life down the line. So I would take everything serious and work hard at it, you know. How long do you think you're going to continue to sub for? I don't know. I don't have any plans of stopping. So right now I really can't afford it either. But, but even so, I still like it. So I, I, I say as long as my health holds up and, you know, I can't see me not enjoying it, you know. But So I say at least another 10 years. That was a lot of questions for Mr. Crow. But I think we know him now. Let's go to the former student section of this documentary, and then it will sadly be over. Hi, I'm Caleb. I'm the um, editor and director of this documentary. Um, I just want to be a part of this too, so I'm just going to be uh, narrating these couple of questions. What was he like in the classroom? He was very fun. Um, he, he was the only substitute that I think other teachers trusted to actually teach. Um, teach the students. Um, he definitely had a balance between having, having a really good time in the classroom and getting the kids um, respect and getting them to listen in the classroom. He was a lot of fun and he like showed his dominance and like but in like the sweetest way like nobody ever tried to pat like cross paths with him or pull one over on him. He um, we always got our work done but we always got to hear his crazy stories. He was really laid back and uh, he was really lenient with a lot of things. Um, he was always just a good person to talk to about anything, whether it was he was suffering for history, music, or anything else. Do you have any stories or experiences of Mr. Crow? Um, I don't really have any specific stories, but it's just always like when he, whenever he was in the classroom, it was like a good day. Like I knew it wasn't going to be a boring class. <laughs> um. Yeah, I have so many stories and experiences. He always talked to me about history and stuff. And uh, we always got into like history of rock and roll because that's something that we both really are passionate about. So that was pretty cool. Nothing specific. I just remember that he made us all laugh and he was constantly like the one that we always wanted in the classroom. And if we had a sub, we everybody was requesting him and would get upset when our teachers couldn't tell us who our sub was going to be. Why do you think you remember him after all this time? Because he taught my brothers um, when they were in high school and he coached my brother's hockey team when he was in eighth grade, I'm pretty sure. And he's always been a consistent sub throughout my high school career. Um, he's one of those guys that you couldn't see him and not smile and not have a good time when he was leading the class as a substitute teacher. Um, he was the most liked substitute teacher um, in my tenure at Penn Mountain. How popular was he? Oh man, it was crazy. Like, he was so, yeah, I mean, everybody said hi to him in the hallways. <laughs> there were a lot of times where uh, I would try and say hi to him and he almost like couldn't say hi to me back because everybody was like swarming him. Uh, not the girls, but like, you know, like everybody just wanted to, you know, like talk to him because he was such a cool dude. Very. I think it's harder not to know Mr. Crow than it is harder <laughs> than it is to know Mr. Crow. Everybody in the district knows him and outside of the district, so I'd say he's pretty popular. Oh, by far the most popular. Yeah, by a long shot. Oh, they'd be high-fiving him, um, yelling his name, like, yeah, he was very, very much liked. Oh, everybody knew him. 
everybody was up and high fives and yelling his name down the hallway and excited to see him in the school. <laughs> I will be taking it over now to end because sadly this documentary is over. You can go back to whatever you were doing before. Wait, wait, I forgot the credits. Here they are. Now you can go get on with your life. And thank you for watching.